Hello everyone and welcome to episode 98. Today's show will be all about the most basal lineage of animals with descendants that still exist in the world's oceans. These are the periphera, more commonly known as the sponges. By almost any metric that you use to compare them to the rest of the animal kingdom, the sponges are extremely simple, with relatively few tissues and cell types, and a complete lack of limbs, organs, muscles, nerves, and, well, pretty much everything else. In a nutshell, they are column-shaped filter feeders, who siphon water through their hollow, channel-perforated bodies. Their larvae can move in the water column, but as they mature, they settle down and remain immobile for the rest of their lives. However, this relative simplicity should not be mistaken for actual simplicity. The sponges are large multicellular organisms with a fascinatingly complex arrangement of their unique tissue and uh, individual cell types, and they've evolved a surprising diversity of diets and lifestyles. As we swim through the world's oceans to explore the periphera biology, I hope you'll come to appreciate the sponges for the incredible and valuable creatures that they are. It's a shame that they're so often overlooked and underrated, as the world's ocean ecosystems would look very different without them. I suppose it's fair to say that in this episode, I will make the case for the sponge. So with that said, let's dive in and get started. The sponges, as you might know, are immobile, filter-feeding animals. They typically have column-shaped bodies covered in pores which take in water, and a central cylindrical cavity in the core of the body called an osculum, which operates sort of like a chimney for the expulsion of nutrient-tapped water and digestive wastes. The typical sponge body has two thin layers of cells, sandwiching a thicker layer of gelatinous goop called mesohyl which provides structural support. Most sponges also produce some kind of mineralized particle, like a spiny mass of silicon dioxide or calcium carbonate, called a spicule. These spicules are also used for structural support. The mineral compound is produced and deposited inside the mesohyl, where it acts as a hard point for the attachment of collagen fibers or other spicules. Sometimes, these spicules can protrude from the sponge, where it basically becomes a thorn or a spike that deters predators, kind of like an aquatic cactus. The key features that group the sponges into the animal kingdom are as follows. They're multicellular, so they're not bacteria or archaea. They're heterotrophs, which basically means they need to eat stuff to grow, so they're not autotrophs like plants. Also, unlike plants, and unlike fungi, the sponges do not have cells protected by a stiff cell wall. Like animal cells, the sponge cells have a naked plasma membrane. And perhaps most distinctive, the sponges use dimorphic gametes to reproduce. In other words, they use sperm to find and fertilize an egg. Genetically, they seem to be grouped with the tenophores as the most basal animal lineages, or, in other words, they're the animals most closely related to the coenoflagellates and the other opisthocons, like fungi. In the context of the evolutionary history of animals, the sponges predate, well, pretty much everything. They predate the protostomes and the deuterostomes. They predate the diploblasts with their radial symmetry and they appear to be the monophyletic descendants of a common ancestor that they share with the rest of the animal kingdom. The oldest estimates for the origination of the crown group of modern sponges is uh, sometime between 700 and 900 million years ago. That's a really rough approximation, because the earliest sponges would have been super fragile. They would have been soft-bodied animals that didn't fossilize well so any evidence of them is likely to be extremely rare, if it exists at all. The data upon which these oldest estimates are made comes not from actual fossils, but from chemical residues found in places like the South Oman Salt Basin. These chemical residues are like layers or masses of concentrated steranes. These tetracyclic molecules are similar in structure to many steroids, 
and are themselves generated from steroid and sterol precursors. These chemicals are a common ingredient in animal cell membranes, so their presence indicates the presence of an ancestral animal group. Specifically, the sponges produce sterol molecules with about 30 carbon atoms, which degrade into residues known to be rich in compounds like 24 isopropyl cholestanes. The demosponges, for example, are the only organisms that add methyl groups to the 26th carbon in the sterol, and this chemical clue can be used to identify them. These uh, carbon residues, sampled in the South Oman salt basin, are at least 635 million years old, predating the Marinoan glaciation. The thinking is that if these groups already existed 635 million years ago, with large populations that left behind chemical evidence, they must belong to a lineage that's even older. If we fill in the missing time with data from molecular clocks and genetic regression analysis, one produces an estimated origin date around 700, 800, maybe even 900 million years ago. As for the actual fossils, the oldest ones that are unambiguous sponges have been dated to around 580 million years old, near the middle of the Ediacaran time period that preceded the Cambrian. In the context of evolutionary history, this would have been a time of drastic change. The world had experienced several periods of severe glaciation, including the Sturtian glaciation that lasted from about 717 to 660 million years ago. For this almost 60 million year long span of time, pulses of glaciation froze the planet, gradually progressing into a complete snowball Earth that persisted for millions of years before regressing backwards in pulses to a more temperate climate over millions more years, before doing it again and again. This prolonged period of repeated glaciations presented difficulties for the aquatic life at the time, as the sheer extent of the ice coverage would have slowed down hydrological cycles and affected the distribution of mineral nutrients. But these difficulties were surmountable, and each glaciation pulse created evolutionary pressures that helped slowly transform the world's earliest multicellular creatures. Around 660 million years ago, when the Sturtian Ice Age ended for good, the world entered a brief hothouse period of rapid diversification and ecological recovery. Having been savaged by the Sturtian Ice Age and the sudden swing into hotter temperatures were many of the more basal lineages of bacterial phytoplankton. With their populations exhausted, they were quickly replaced by lineages of algae and other microscopic eukaryotes. This led to a major overhaul or turnover event at the lowest layers of the food chain. The larger, more complex eukaryotes were now very common, including the photosynthesizing algaes, with their greater oxygen production capacity. This was an incredibly important transition, as it accelerated the slow buildup of oxygen in the oceans. Oxygen was gradually becoming more and more abundant. Furthermore, with the glacial ice sheets having receded back towards the poles, there was more sediment from the land being washed by rain into the oceans, so there was an uptick in mineral nutrients as well. These environmental factors, plus the overturning at the base of the food web, facilitated the emergence of larger, more complex multicellular forms. This is around the time the first sponges must have appeared, according to those sterane residues in the South Oman salt basin. Eventually, this hothouse period came to an end as the global climate transitioned into the Marinoan glaciation around 635 million years ago. This was yet another snowball Earth period, although it was relatively brief, and it came to an end when greenhouse gases from extensive volcanic activity warmed up the climate. Importantly, the Marinoan glaciation saw extensive periods where the water level was lower, and there were widespread shallow water seas and fledgling marine ecosystems. These shallow water habitats would have benefited massively from the increasing proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere, which went from 3% before the Sturtian to 12% by the Marinoan, as well as the improved access to sunlight and mineral nutrients. <laughs>
This was a boon for multicellular life, as oxygen provided high-energy electrons for aerobic respiration. In other words, the chemical energy that eukaryotic life needed to power its growth and activity had become much more abundant and accessible in the water column, and the early metazoans were able to evolve larger and more complex bodies. The ancestral sponge body form was a globular mass, likely a colony-like structure of coenoflagellate-like cells that filter-fed dissolved organic material in the water column. The coenoflagellates are the single-celled organisms most closely related to the animals. We share a billion-year-old common ancestor. The sponges, the most primitive offshoot of this new animal lineage that's still alive today, have an inner tissue lined with cells that are remarkably similar to coenoflagellates. If you listened to the last episode, then you should remember that the coenoflagellates have a flagella, which they rotate to move forward through the water and to also create a current that carries dissolved nutrients into their bodies. The sponges have a sheet of tissue on their inner surface, on their gut lining, that's lined with coenoflagellate-like cells. And when they all wave their flagella simultaneously, they create currents that carries water through the sponge's internal cavities, and smaller currents that suck nutrients out of the water and through this layer of coenocytes into the sponge's body itself, where it can be broken down and absorbed and diffused and distributed to all the other cells in the body. However, research within the last decade suggests that the relationship isn't so straightforward. There are many chemical differences between coenoflagellates and the coenocytes lining the inner surface of the sponges, like the protein composition of the collar at the base of the flagella, and a, a few details about their development. I mentioned this in the last episode. These differences suggest that they may actually not be simple homologs, where perhaps color-bearing cells were lost and then re-evolved, possibly multiple times. The implications of this could be quite profound, including the possibility that bilateral symmetry evolved earlier than we thought, but sponges represent a lineage that lost all symmetry in the adult form, while the tenophores evolved rotational symmetry, and the later nadarians evolved radial symmetry, independently. This is an ongoing area of research, and not much is known for certain. A lot of stuff is still pretty mysterious. But the point that I'm trying to get at here is that the sponges are more complex than they seem. Yes, they're among the earliest animal lineages ever, and while it's really easy to think of them as primitive, you should recognize an important fact. In all of the time that the rest of the animal kingdom has had to evolve, in all of those hundreds of millions of years where the primitive bilateral slug-like ancestor spawned lineages of mollusks and arthropods and vertebrates and sapient biped primates, in all of that time, the sponges have also been evolving and diversifying on their own. In the modern day, there's an estimated 10 to 11,000 known species of sponge, although some estimates are as high as 15,000 species. Some three-quarters of them belong to the class called Demospongia, which is also the oldest living branch of Periphera, with fossils dating back to about 580 million years ago. These Demosponges outcompeted and replaced the Archaeocyathids, an even older group of sponges which are now extinct, but represent a very old and once very diverse clade with over a hundred families. The Archaeocyathids were the first animals that built reefs with their mineralized bodies, which were the basis for many complex aquatic ecosystems in the mid-Cambrian. The Demosponges were far more robust, perhaps because of their exoskeletons. They had evolved to deposit layers of silicon dioxide outside of their bodies, producing large, hard clumps, or bony tree-like forms, that are heavily porous and filled with channels. Lining the inner surface of these pores and channels, or lining the outer surface of the large clumps, are the soft tissues of the sponge itself. Embedded in the epidermal tissue that makes contact with the water are the coenocytes. These are those coenoflagellate-like cells that we discussed a moment ago. They have the flagella that spin around to create a current that moves water through the body's channels, and also brings smaller currents of water into the cells themselves to filter out any dissolved organic particles to break down as food. As the oldest and most diverse sponge class, 
the demo sponges have adapted to a wide range of habitats, with various demo sponge species found at almost all depths, from shallow water coastal reef habitats, and even the intertidal zone, all the way down to the pitch dark abyssal zone. Surprisingly, there's even a branch of demo sponge whose approximately 150 known species have adapted to live in freshwater. This freshwater branch of sponges is relatively young. Where the ancestral demo sponges appeared approximately 580 million years ago, this branch of descendants, this freshwater adapted offshoot, emerged a mere 40 million years ago. Around 540 million years ago, the first known fossils of the hexactinellids, or the, the glass sponges, begin to appear. These are recognizable from their silica-based spicules, which have a unique geometry. Instead of being shaped like a spear with one point, the glass sponge spicules are shaped like a star with four or six points. These are jumbled together to form a complex matrix of silica spikes, and the living tissue fills in the space between them. They don't form mineralized exoskeletons, but instead they form this somewhat stiffer tissue that's enriched with these multipoint spicules. The glass sponges are also generally pale, with an epidermis that ranges from a pale orange to a creamy white to semi-translucent. With a handful of exceptions, they're generally found in deeper water, approximately 500 to 1,000 meters under the surface. They're also believed to be long-lived, with a potential lifespan measured in centuries, with some species estimated to be able to live multiple thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Around 520 million years ago, the first known calcareous sponges appeared. These are generally found in shallow water ecosystems, like reefs and shelves and similar marine biomes in the tropics, where they settle on hard surfaces like rocks and corals. The calcarea are a relatively small but important group, with about 400 species that are characterized by their ability to synthesize calcium carbonates, the most common being aragonite and calcite. They don't have spicules embedded in the mesohill, but instead, they grow them on the outside of their bodies and embedded in the epidermal tissue. Their spicules have two to four points, depending on the species, but most have a three-point, trident-like spicule that assist in both self-defense and in the formation of a reinforcing mesh that enhances the physical integrity of the sponge's body. Unlike the hexactinellid glass sponges, these calcareous sponges and other sponges that live in shallow water tropical habitats are generally short-lived, with a lifespan measured in single or double-digit numbers of years. Another even smaller class are the Homo scleromorpha, with just about 100 species. These guys are particularly strange, because they prefer dark, well-shaded areas, and yet, only a few species live at depths greater than 800 or 900 meters, and rarely over a kilometer deep. They're mostly shallow water sponges, but they tend to live at the lower, more shaded areas of reef habitats, underneath rocky overhangs, or most frequently, in underwater caves. In a survey conducted in the Mediterranean Sea in 2008 and 2009, Researchers found that more than 80% of these Homo scleromorpha sponges lived in caves, and among those, more than 40% were endemic to the general cave habitat, or the, the specific cave network in which they were found. The Placortis genus, for example, includes several sponges that grow on the walls and even hang from the ceilings of caves. The Homo scleromorpha usually have very small spicules, that are used just for the, the physical, structural reinforcement of their soft tissues. Okay, now here's where things get really crazy. So far we have the exoskeleton, which is porous and filled with internal channels. The interior of these channels are lined with the sponge's living biomass. In direct contact with the water is the coanoderm, that layer of coanocyte-bearing tissue lining the sponge's guts. It's what absorbs the food particles right out of the water. It's like that interface between the external watery environment and the internal body of the sponge. 
The rest of the sponge's soft body, the rest of its living biomass, lies in between these two surfaces, squished between this gut-lining layer of coenoderm and the hard inner walls of the exoskeleton. This internal layer is full of collagen, forming a semi-rigid matrix called the mesohyll. It's kind of like an activity space or a playground for all of the other kinds of cells in the sponge's body. Glass sponges don't really have that much mesohyll at all, as their visceral mass is primarily composed of that thick, silica spicule matrix flooded with cytoplasm. All sponges are generally cup or chimney-like. They absorb water near their base, their lower body portions, where the water current is slower and it has a higher concentration of organic particles, like from debris and detritus swept up from the seafloor. Bacteria are about half a micrometer in diameter, which is small enough that they easily get sucked into the sponge's pores and filtered out by the coenocytes. But larger particles that can't be digested are simply too large to make it through the pores. The incoming water is cycled through the body structure. The food is extracted, oxygen is absorbed, and then nutrient-tapped water and metabolic wastes like ammonia and CO2 are brought into the central cavity, or the osculum, to get lifted up and out of the sponge by the, the faster currents higher up off the surface. In this way, sponges exploit some of the energy in the surrounding current to help them move water passively through their bodies. The sponge's body, or subunits of it, have an internal anatomy and a structure that can be grouped into one of three broad types. The simplest structural body type is the ascanoid pattern, where the tissue forms a simple hollow bulb made from a single layer of mesohyll with panacocytes on the outside and coanocytes on the inside. Water from the outside is siphoned through pores in the thin layer of the bulb, bringing the water into this semi-enclosed microenvironment inside the core chamber of the sponge. Here, the coenocytes can easily filter out food particles, and the remaining wastewater is expelled out the osculum at the top. Because of its simplicity, ascanoid body forms are usually pretty small. By the time they achieve about one millimeter in body diameter, they've reached the upper limit on their ability to sustain themselves by diffusion alone. A slightly more complex structural body type can be seen in the sicanoid pattern. This is similar to the ascanoid, except instead of the coenocytes forming a single layer along the inner surface of this, this bulb-like inner chamber, there are instead many small indentations throughout the mesohyll, like grooves or holes, and these are lined with coenocytes. Effectively, it's a morphology that maximizes surface area, sort of like the inverted cortex of a brain, or perhaps it's more akin to a cross-section of your small intestine. The visceral mass of the sicanoid sponge is thickened because it developed deeper grooves and folds along its surface. To make a really simple visualization, think of the ascanoid pattern as a simple, flat sheet of paper, whereas the sicanoid pattern is like if you accordion-folded the paper, or crumpled it up and then partially smoothed it out again. You can see that the sicanoid pattern has a more complex topography, meaning it would have proportionately more surface area than an ascanoid sponge. In addition to having more surface area with more coenocytes to absorb more nutrients, this more topographically complex sicanoid pattern also creates smaller microenvironments. The various folds and grooves and crevices create tiny areas where the water current can be turned into a, a micro-eddy or a mini-lagoon sort of thing, where the water is calmer and food particles are easier to extract. The whole sicanoid morphology makes the sponge more durable and more efficient. This improved food intake and internal complexity reduces the pressure of nutrient diffusion, which basically means that sponges with the sicanoid body form can grow up to a few centimeters in diameter. They're not limited to just a single millimeter. The third body type is the most complex. This is the leuconoid pattern. In this body form, the central inner cavity, this osculum, is actually much reduced. 
It's more of a narrow waist shoot rather than a large inner chamber. The layers of the bulb have thickened even more, and this internal space is filled with mesohyl. And within this mesohyl, there's a massively complex network of pores and channels connecting a series of bubbles or even smaller globular cavities. So it's kind of like alveoli in the lungs. Depending on the species of sponge, there are thousands to millions of these little bubbles in the mesohyl lined with coanocytes. The entire setup pushes the spongy envelope on ways to maximize food absorption, and as a result, leuconoid sponges can grow to be over a meter in diameter, or even way more than that, as they slowly grow and expand laterally along the surface of their substrate. I should also briefly mention that there's about 140 known species of carnivorous sponge who have, to one degree or another, lost these filter-feeding body patterns and moved in an entirely novel evolutionary direction. The carnivorous sponges tend to be deep water and or cave-dwelling species, which makes them somewhat difficult to study, and as a result, unfortunately, relatively little is known about them. From what few specimens are known, they depict a group of strange animals that have evolved to use hairs or fibers extruding from their body to entangle prey, like some hapless crustacean that happened to be walking by. These fibers are either coated in a sticky substance, or they're composed of spicules and have mechanical properties like hooking and abrasion that could be loosely compared to a strip of Velcro, or like a studded whip, or a wiry drain snake, or something. Curiously, they don't seem to use venoms, or stingers, or anything like that to capture their prey. They rely on good old-fashioned mechanical obstruction, with sticky goo and ensnaring spicules. In any case, the threads are able to trap the prey animal, and slowly bring it into the central cavity of the sponge to be digested, kind of like how a jellyfish does it or just by holding the food against its body and slowly dissolving it and absorbing the nutrients like a saprophytic fungus. If you think about it, this is really rather terrifying for the prey animal. Imagine you're a fish and you get tangled up in one of these sponges. It doesn't have any nidocytes, it doesn't have any neurotoxic venoms to knock you out or stun you or kill you quickly, it doesn't have any of that. So you're just stuck in its ensnaring grasp you can't escape, you're not knocked out, you're just awake and aware as it's dragging you slowly closer to it, closer to its mouth, which is inevitably going to just slowly gum you to death because they don't have teeth, and then dissolve you. That's horrifying. These carnivorous sponges are like benthic nightmares. Taxonomically speaking, most of these carnivorous sponges appear to be in the family Clatterizidae, which live in deep water areas around the world. Whereas most sponges look like chimneys or clubs, or large lumps with a folded surface, kind of like a rocky brain, the Clatterizidae are different. They have more slender and elongated body shapes, typically with limbs covered in stiff bristles, spines, or thorns. Some species, like Asbestopluma hypogea, have what appear to be anglerfish-like bobbles extending from a stalk in the ground, although instead of a gentle and enticing bioluminescent light like the anglerfish uses, these spongy bobbles are covered in long, thin arms or spines, reminiscent of some kind of medieval mace. Carnivory seems to be a really high-risk, high-reward strategy for the sponge. Capturing a prey animal, like a small fish or a crustacean, would seem to be a bit dangerous, as those animals have hard body parts, and they can fight back and possibly injure the sponge, and there's not a whole lot the sponge can do to retaliate or defend itself. But when it can ensnare something and get it in the osculum for digestion, it's a huge payday. Compared to filter-feeding bacteria, dissolving a, a tiny crab or a shrimp or a small fish might as well be a feast compare this to a bunch of dissolved algae that they extract out of the water. Compared to that, a little fish or a, a, a little prawn, that's awesome. That's, that's a huge meal. The sponges are also unique because they have a few different cell types, but 
these cells are not really arranged into tissues, like cells are in other animals. Aside from the epidermal tissues, with its somewhat organized layer of coenocytes and panacocytes, the other cell types in the sponge's body are weirdly detached. They're, they're free-floating and mobile and able to move through the sponge's body. They're able to do this by moving within the mesohyl matrix. A number of different cell types can migrate and move around and reposition themselves, and even turn into other cell types. So in this way, the mesohyl is kind of like a weird swimming pool in which these free-moving cells can move around to engage in various activities that sustain the sponge and keep it alive. For example, the sclerocytes are the cells that produce the mineralized spicules, which are then secreted and embedded in the mesohyl. I mentioned earlier that these spicules can serve as hard points for collagen fibers to anchor to, or they can interlock with each other to form larger, stronger chains or matrices, all of which can increase the mesohyl's structural support capacity, the robustness of the sponge's physical form. The mesohyl itself is constructed and maintained by a few different cell types. Lophocytes and colonocytes both move with a ponderous amoeba-like motion through the collagen matrix, where they secrete more collagen fibers to reinforce and build up the mesohyl. The demo sponges also have a cell type called spongocytes that produce modified collagen called spongin that can make the mesohyl extra stiff, so it's like an extra form of both protection and structural support. There's also a special type of cell that forms a hollow cylinder. These are called porocytes because, well, they make pores, and they facilitate the flow of water and nutrients throughout the tissue and the mesohyl matrix of the sponge. Another important cell type that I've mentioned briefly a few times now are the panacocytes, which are broad, flat cells that cover all the parts of the epidermis where the coenocytes don't. These play a really important role in both anchoring the sponge to the rock or whatever substrate it's on, and on creating a protective outer layer on the upper or outer surface of the sponge. The coenocytes are concentrated on the inner gut-like tissue where they can absorb food, but on the outside, where uh, the sponge is more interested in protecting itself from like mechanical abrasion or predatory attack, these panacocytes form a thin but moderately protective sheet of epidermal tissue. There's a few other types of cells floating around in the mesohyl too, like the so-called gray cells that reportedly function as a kind of rudimentary sponge immune system with a few defensive signaling chemicals and antibacterial toxins. There's also the oocytes that produce the eggs, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes, and a generalist type of cell called an archaeocyte that performs basic janitorial functions like maintaining the flow of food particles throughout the body and clearing debris from the sponge's mini pores and internal channels. The archaeocyte has another special ability. It's totipotent, which means it can differentiate into many other different types of cells, including gametic egg cells used in reproduction. On that note, the sperm gametes are produced by altered coenocytes. I want to pause for a moment and reflect on what it is we're talking about here and why it's actually super crazy. Unlike almost every other animal, the cells within the sponge's body are not anchored to a substrate or a bed layer in the tissue. Aside from the epidermis with its many panacocytes and coenocytes, there really aren't any tissues at all. Instead, the inner dynamics of the sponge's body are composed of this, this loose collection of specialized single cells, floating around in the mesohyl matrix, moving through it like they were molecular monkeys swinging in a collagen forest. In every other animal, like all vertebrates, for example, tissues are usually composed of cells grown in layers. These layers of cells are grown from a bed substrate or a bed matrix, and this is like a thick layer of cells enriched with connective fibers, and it forms like a thick, sturdy basis, like a foundation to a building. And all of the softer cells, like your epidermal cells or uh, you know, cells in the cortex of an organ, like your kidney or your liver or something like that, these cells all generate from this bed matrix and grow off of it. It's a super important evolutionary development that we see in the animals, but it's not seen 
in the sponges. This is just a testament to how primitive their lineage is. It, it diverged so long ago that they weren't part of the stem group that developed bed tissues. Something that basic is just incredible. And this histology, this cell physiology and cell function that they've developed in lieu of bed substrates is super unique and, and wild. I just think it's really cool, and I wanted to impress that on you, and, and perhaps you think it's crazy too, you know? And uh, if you think that's wild, and I hope you do because it is, it gets even weirder. Let me bring your attention back to the glass sponges I mentioned earlier. These glass sponges are unlike every other sponge in the sense that they don't have the same kind of cellular architecture. Instead of having a bunch of individual differentiated cells floating around, like, like the rest of the sponges, which is already pretty crazy, the glass sponges have syncytia, or massive, body-sprawling, amoeba-like cells with multiple nuclei. In some cases, the entire organic soft tissue body is formed from a continuous mass of cytoplasm, all wrapped up in more or less a single, gigantic membrane. Or in other words, it's one titanic cell with countless nuclei floating throughout it. If you've listened to earlier episodes of the podcast, then you've probably remember me using the term syncytia before, or like a, a syncytial form or something like that. Usually I've used this term when referring to like really primitive plants like bryophytes or like fungus. There are certain syncytial fungus. So the fact that, that uh, these glass sponges, some of their species, are basically syncytial animals, that's just incredible. That's so wild to me. It's so cool that biology can produce something like this. Now, all of this is really cool, but perhaps one of the most fascinating aspects of sponge physiology is their neural system, or rather, their lack thereof. They don't have nerves, like you see in the rest of the animal kingdom. They don't even have nerve nets, which are simple nervous systems that you see in jellyfish and anemones. But what they do have are myocyte cells, and a handful of genes that happen to belong to the same gene families that make some of the proteins used in the nervous systems in other animals. For example, genes that build postsynaptic structures that receive neurotransmitters, so like cell receptors. These might be used in a diffusion-based analog of a neural system, where certain cells, or perhaps all of the internal cells, may be able to carry chemical signals analogous to neurotransmitters. It's not exactly understood how they communicate or coordinate cellular activity across their body, but somehow they can do it. The panacocytes in the epidermis can rhythmically contract, creating a subtle flexing motion that helps push water through their pores and internal channels. In some species, they even exist around the top orifice, the osculum, sort of like in the vertebrate eyeball, where the iris can constrict in response to light. These panacocytes can also extrude limbs of cytoplasm, sort of like an amoeba, and crawl along the seafloor or the surface of the rock or whatever substrate it's sitting on. Some species can use their panacocytes to move, albeit at a glacial pace of 1 to 4 millimeters a day. In the glass sponges, their syncytia allows them to send electrochemical signals across their body very quickly. Because the internal visceral mass is largely a continuous volume of cytoplasm with multiple nuclei, neuron-like adjustment of the membrane potential may be able to rapidly transmit information from, from one end of the body to the other. There's also evidence suggesting some kind of hair-like fibers may be used to transmit signals. It's also possible that a signaling molecule, like some sort of neurotransmitter analog, may be sent downriver, so to speak, along the currents in the cytoplasm that work their way through the spicule matrix. There are several functional purposes for this body-wide cellular communication system. We already mentioned the need to coordinate contractions to maintain a flow of water through the body, but this system can also be used to arrest the flagella to stop their spinning. So for example, if the sponge detects toxins or irritants coming into its body chambers, for example, perhaps there was a, a big wave and it whipped up some sediment, and a big mudslide of sediment landed on the sponge and filled up some of its pores, well, that could be a problem, and it doesn't want to necessarily use those pores and choke itself on all the sediment there. 
so it can use this cellular communication system to arrest the movement of the flagella in the affected parts of the body, to stop the spinning of the flagella and collapse the microcurrents created by the choanocytes, preventing them from bringing in more water and therefore stopping them from bringing in more irritants or toxins or whatever. Furthermore, at least in the soft-bodied sponges, this ability for the panacocytes to contract allows the entire body to contract. Some of these soft-bodied sponges can squeeze themselves down, making themselves shorter, to better hide among the rocks or other creatures in a reef habitat. This body-wide contraction makes them smaller, it reduces their visual profile, and it makes them less noticeable to predatory fish and sea turtles and other large, free-swimming predators that may be looking for an easy meal. Okay, let's take a moment to pause and breathe and look back at everything we've covered so far. We began the episode with a rundown of sponge evolution and took some notes on the various sponge classes like the demo sponges and the glass sponges and the calcareous sponges. Then we talked about the general body form and internal structure of a sponge, including the ascanoid, sicanoid, and leuconoid body forms which included details on the foods they eat and the way they breathe and excrete waste. Then we explored the various cell types and cellular dynamics at work inside the sponge's visceral mass. Well now, I want to turn our attention from the guts of the sponge, their insides, to the outside of the sponge. I want to look at their ecology and their relationships with other organisms in their environment. In my opinion, one of the most amazing aspects of sponge ecology are their symbioses with various microbes. Sponges can host complex communities of microbes that offer a wide menu of ecological services. Certain microbes can provide metabolites that might offer immunological benefits to the sponge or just basic nutrition, or they can also produce some sort of toxin or defensive chemical that wards off predators. Many sponges that live in nutrient-poor marine habitats are known to host dinoflagellates, or cyanobacteria, in their pores and exoskeletons. Freshwater sponges often make symbioses with green algae, which are nested in the archaeocytes, much like the chloroplasts are nested inside the cells of plants. These microbes enjoy safety and protection inside the sponge, as well as a steady incoming supply of nutrients, thanks in part to the sponge. In return, these symbiotes can photosynthesize, producing chemical energy in the form of sugars that they then feed to the sponge. Sponges have made a few interesting adaptations to accommodate their photosynthesizing friends. These particular sponges tend to live in shallow water habitats, where the sunlight still reaches the seafloor, and they tend to grow horizontally, their bodies forming broad leaf-like shelves that maximize the surface area exposed to sunlight. As an aside, this also creates uh, overhangs and shaded areas in the reef community, in the reef habitat, and you'll have all manner of other species like crustaceans and fish and even other sponges that prefer to live in these smaller, more shaded parts of the habitat, these micro-habitats, if you will. Now, because of all of these photosynthesizing microbial symbionts, the sponge microbe collective produces a relatively large amount of oxygen almost three times more than the sponge itself consumes. The corals, which belong to a closely related nadarian clade, also have photosynthetic symbionts, and together, these sponges and corals and all of the microbes that live on and in them, they all act kind of like an aquatic version of a forest, or like the aquatic version of trees in a coral reef ecosystem. And much like the squirrels and the lizards and the birds that live in the trees, the sponges also form mutualisms and symbioses with larger animals. The Synalpheus genus of snapping shrimp are known to live in colonies of hundreds or even thousands that all inhabit a single individual sponge. This arrangement offers protection for the shrimp, as well as food, as they collect the food particles that are too big for the sponge to ingest, and as a consequence, prevent them from building up along the base of the sponge. In return, all of their metabolic waste and the detritus from their shed exoskeletons and their dead, decaying bodies, this all provides nutrients for the sponge, 
Even more interesting, this relationship has had a profound evolutionary effect on the shrimp. Each species of shrimp generally only colonizes one species of sponge. So, when ecological events, or selective pressures, or just random accidents see them colonize a different species of sponge, it can rapidly lead to a kind of allopatric speciation. As a result, the Synalphia shrimp are an unusually diverse and species-rich group. A similar species-specific dynamic can be seen in hermit crabs, which may have a friendly sponge growing on its shell. When the hermit crab grows too big for its old shell and it seeks out a new shell, it'll bring the sponge buddy along with it, often using the sponge as a literal shield to fight off any curious fish or crabs until it finds a new suitable shell to nest into. The sponge buddy is then placed on top of the new shell, and it grows from there. A rather strange example of animal-sponge interactions comes from a small community of bottlenose dolphins that live in Shark Bay off the western coast of Australia. The mothers in this community have been observed teaching their daughters how to pick up certain kinds of soft sponges and to hold them at the tip of their beak to use as cushions so that they can search around for food and move rocks and stuff along the seafloor without bruising or scraping their snout. It's a rather ingenious cultural development, and due to the limited extent of the practice geographically, it appears to be a relatively recent innovation in a particular dolphin population in Shark Bay, Australia. Now for their part, the sponges are remarkably defensive and territorial creatures. This might seem surprising at first because they're immobile and they seem largely stationary and like they don't even react to stuff. But if you think about it a little bit more, it, it starts to make more sense, because the fact that they're immobile means that they're at the whims of whatever hungry creature or exploitative dolphin comes by. Being large, fleshy organisms with no ability to run away, they are particularly vulnerable to even slow-moving predators like starfish and sea slugs. To deter these predators, some sponges are known to excrete or shed some of their spicules, creating a carpet of rough mineral fragments that forms kind of like a protective moat or a mound around them. The spicules are sharp and jagged, and when they come into contact with the starfish's soft tube feet, their hard mineralized points can scrape, puncture, and disable the soft pressurized capsules. They can maim and potentially cripple the starfish, preventing it from climbing on the sponge and chewing it up. So, in effect, this layer of spicules, this, this moat of spicules, is like a sponge version of an area denial weapon, like a wall of barbed wire, or perhaps more accurately, like a, a whole bunch of caltrops placed around the door of a castle or something. In any case, these protective mounds of spicules can accumulate. The sponge will just keep depositing them, and they can grow to become several meters deep as the sponge just keeps growing and dropping spicules over its multi-century lifespan. Sponges are also known to produce a small repertoire of toxins and various biodisruptive compounds that they use defensively. A really cool example is the nitrogen-rich bromopyrrol metabolites called agaliferins. These operate kind of like a powerful cleaning solution as they have antibacterial effects and they can disrupt the formation of biofilms, or the buildup of a layer of foreign cells and their secretions on the outside of the body. Sponges use chemicals like these agaliferins to kill off bacteria and break up these parasitic microbial communities before they interfere with the sponge's food intake, or disrupt its symbionts, or give it an infection or something. The sponges are known to use toxins to fend off larger predators, including vertebrates like fish and sea turtles. But the exact mechanism of action behind these toxins, and their ultimate effectiveness at deterring predation, has not been conclusively determined yet. From what I've read, it seems like these sponge toxins aren't used offensively, they're not used for hunting, they're used defensively to ward off predators, and in that sense, they're not going to deliver a sting or a stun or something like that, like a nidocyte. They're not going to inflict pain on the predator, but they're perhaps more like a bad smell, like, like a noxious odor or some kind of mild irritant like that 
that just turns off the predator and turns their stomach and makes them look for food elsewhere. Perhaps the most fascinating part of sponge ecology is a process called the sponge loop. The process starts with the sponge absorbing and eating food, which for it is basically dissolved organic material, like rotting bits of plant or flakes of some dead animal, or the dissolved mucus of a microbial colony, or the wastes and exudates from corals and algaes, you know, whatever. All of this stuff is food that can be absorbed by the sponge. The sponge will absorb this material as it gets filtered into its body, and it'll integrate the carbon and the nutrients into its own tissues, its own flesh. And then, in turn, the sponge will die, or it'll get injured and parts of it will break off and decay, or it's nipped at and eaten by predators and its carbon goes into the bodies of other organisms. In any case, its carbon is released back into the food chain to feed larger animals like scavengers and detrivores. These animals, in turn, will eventually die, and their corpses will return nutrients back into the pool of dissolved organic material that the living sponges absorb. So in this way, the sponges play a critical role in the food web by facilitating the movement of carbon and other nutrients from the relatively mineralized and difficult-to-eat corals into higher trophic levels with animals like crabs, starfish, lobsters, and fish. In a nutshell, the sponge loop is a smaller, semi-self-sustaining ecological cycle that exists within the greater marine food web and aquatic ecosystem. Now the last topic that I'd like to explore today is sponge reproduction and the sponge life cycle. It's a remarkably strange and fascinating topic, and I think that if we were to study this more, we as the scientific community, we would make a lot of discoveries pertaining to the early evolution of animal life. The most important detail here is that the sponges are capable of both asexual and sexual reproduction, and this is just one more way that they represent a transition from an older, more simpler mode of life into a more complex, eukaryotic animal mode of life. Now, asexual reproduction in sponges involves a few methods that are similar to that seen in bryophytes and other primitive plants, namely fragmentation and gemmules. Fragmentation is a common method of asexual reproduction. It's seen not just in bryophytes, but also in fungi and bacterial colonies. In the sponges, fragments can be broken off the main body in any number of ways. Injuries from larger animals, impact with debris, a strong water current, all sorts of things can all cause pieces of the sponge to break off. And so long as these pieces of sponge contain the cells that can build mesohyl and the archaeocytes that can differentiate and regenerate all of the other cell types, then this little bit of broken off sponge can stay alive. It can resettle itself somewhere else and then begin life anew as a tiny, cloned sponge. The other primary method of asexual reproduction is done through a structure called a gemmule. Gemmules are kind of like miniature sponge eggs. They've been described as escape pods, or life rafts, or perhaps more fittingly, like an interstellar colony ship carrying enough people to establish a healthy gene pool on a new planet. All metaphors aside, the gemmules are clusters of archaeocytes that have been fattened up with nutrients, and then wrapped in comfortable sponge in and reinforced with spicules. Some freshwater species of sponge are known to incorporate algae into the gemmule to facilitate this symbiotic relationship in their offspring pretty much immediately from the moment of birth, so to speak. These gemmules can enter a dormant state, where they can survive extremes of temperature, hydration, and anoxia. When conditions are suitable, which can be years, even decades later, they can reactivate and germinate, for lack of a better word, and grow a new sponge from the seed-like gemmule. A small handful of sponge species reproduce through budding, where a new individual grows directly off of its parent as a polyp, and then eventually detaches to become its own free-floating organism that will move along, float along in the current to settle somewhere, and then become its own sessile sponge. All right, now that's asexual reproduction in sponges. All things considered, it's relatively simple and straightforward. We see similar mechanisms in other organisms, and so nothing is 
too out of the ordinary here. But sexual reproduction in sponges and the development of larvae from an embryo is where things get really weird and complicated. The majority of sponges are hermaphrodites, meaning that a given individual can simultaneously produce eggs and sperm. This is particularly interesting, as the sponges don't have gonad tissue to produce their gametes, like all the rest of the protostomes and deuterostomes. Instead, the sponges' archaeocytes can differentiate into eggs, which have been observed to absorb smaller nutrient-packed cells to build a sponge analog of an amniotic sac. Coenocytes can differentiate into sperm, which develop in cysts in the epidermis. When the sperm are mature, they burst from the cyst and then disperse into the water, hopefully to find another sponge somewhere. The sperm cells can be absorbed by other sponges, just like a food particle, except they aren't digested. Instead, when a sperm cell is absorbed by a member of the same species, there's chemical tags on its surface that'll get recognized. So the sperm, it won't be digested, it'll get encapsulated in an amoeba-like cell that carries the sperm through the mesohyl, like, like an escort, until it reaches its own egg cells, where it then makes contact and achieves fertilization. The fertilized eggs are usually kept inside the body, but are sometimes released into the water. They rapidly develop into a globular or oval-shaped mass of cells lined with flagella, or cilia, which can be flexed to propel the new larva through the water. These larvae are really interesting, because in some species they exhibit a kind of bilateral symmetry. Furthermore, some species of larva have cells that are remarkably similar to neurons. These are used to help the larva sense its environment and navigate to a suitable spot to settle down. But the fact that they exist at all has made some scientists think that nerves may be much older, evolutionarily speaking, than we think. And the sponges may have evolved an adult form that, instead of simply not having the neurons because they were never evolved, rather, the adult form effectively lost the neurons. That's a very different evolutionary process than the more traditional understanding of the sponges having simply emerged and branched off of the main animal lineage before neurons were developed. In any case, the larva will swim around for a few hours or days until they sink down to the ocean floor. If they have any energy left, they may scuttle around a bit looking for an ideal place to settle down. Once a suitable location has been found and the larva is ready to mature, it'll produce a number of archaeocytes, which will then differentiate into all of the necessary cell types of the adult sponge. The first panacocytes to form will use amoeba-like extensions to reach out and grab onto the substrate to get some purchase. The rest of the sponge will then grow from this initial anchorage point, living a life of quiet filter feeding for the next few years, decades, centuries, or even millennia. Well, that's about all there is on the sponges. We covered a huge amount of material today, and this is actually, I think, one of my longer, if not my longest episodes to date. I hope you found it as mind-blowing and as interesting as I did. For real, though, I, I went into the research and the script-writing part of this episode knowing virtually nothing about sponges, but now I'm genuinely surprised at how complex these animals are. I had always assumed that they were really simple animals, but it seems like no matter what part of them you look at, every aspect of their life and their biology is hiding some awesome secret. I'm particularly impressed by all of the features that reveal the unique evolutionary position of the sponges. Not only do they represent a bridge between the coenoflagellates and the rest of the opisthocons and the rest of the animal kingdom, they also reveal secrets about the transition from single cells, perhaps microbial colonies, to multicellular animal organisms. They display uniquely intermediate features in tissue development, as they lack the basement membranes and diversity of tissue types seen in other animals. But they do have a weird pseudo-community of free-moving cells within their bodies that we don't see anywhere else. And we can see hints of all kinds of features that exist in an atavistic state in the sponges, but that have been heavily developed in the rest of the animals, like the rhythmic contractions of the body being turned into muscle tissue. 
the development of internal digestive spaces that operate like a decentralized gut that would be turned into a fully-fledged digestive system. And of course, the ion pumps and the sponge being from the same gene families as the ion pumps used in the nervous systems of other animals. So there you go. The sponges are an incredible group of animals that are far more complex and dynamic than they might seem at first glance. If you came into this episode not knowing much about sponges, just like I did, then I hope you're as amazed and as impressed as I am at these remarkable creatures. If you enjoyed the show, hit that like button or give it a five-star review. Subscribe to the channel so we can help boost the show in the algorithms and more people can find it and jump into the world of the biological. Buy a shirt at the official store, tell your friends and family about the show, become a Patreon supporter at a tier of your choosing, and as always, thanks for listening.